Thank you, Rocky. It's good to be here. Can you hear me? Uh, yes? Uh, it's very good to be here uh, to talk to you about uh, a, a topic that uh, is fascinating to me. It's a, a, this talk is from a chapter in a new book in which I'm thinking about the history of seeing and visuality among uh, Protestants and Catholics in the modern world the last few centuries to try to understand how important seeing is and how seeing is related to feeling, hearing, thinking, uh, and being in a body. Uh, and it turns out that uh, uh, thinking about what Jesus looks like is something that moderns, say, people since the 16th century have been more or less obsessed with in a variety of different ways. So I want to give you a, a sense of that. Uh, it's true, I think, that uh, when you ask somebody what Jesus looks like, a, an image of some sort comes to their mind. Uh, one they've seen, or maybe a collection, or maybe a kind of amalgamation of a bunch of images they've seen, even if they don't, even if they know in another part of their brain that, well, he didn't really look like that, I mean, we don't know what he looked like. But there's this kind of visual force in our imaginations that often prompts us at least to have a set of expectations about what he looks like. And I'm intrigued by that phenomenon. Why is it that, we, that Jesus has to have a look? Why, why are we inclined, maybe not all of us, not all of the time, and not everywhere in the world in the same way, of course, but why is there this, uh, this expectation that he had a look, a particular look? Um, so I want to think about that and maybe start with uh, this painting because I'm going to come back to it later in the talk. This is a painting by Rembrandt, a Dutch painter in the 17th century. I'm sure you've heard of him before. He did a number of uh, incredibly important paintings for the history of the last several centuries. This is one of several different images of Jesus that he painted uh, about 1656. What intrigues me about this, among other things, is this question that I've put. Why is it, what is it to say that this painting looks like Jesus? What kind of a claim is that? What does that mean? So what I want to do today is break that assertion down to try to examine, examine it historically, to a degree psychologically, even sociologically. What is it to make such a claim? I'd like to start by suggesting there are perhaps three, maybe more, but I'll, I'll go with three different ways in the history of, uh, and I'm speaking here about the history of Christianity, though it needn't be, all of my marks don't have to be limited to Christianity. Um, there are three different ways in which likeness, the likeness of Jesus has been understood uh, by Christians. The first one um, is the idea that there is a resemblance of an image and an original, that the image looks like the original. Uh, and I'm showing you an, an, an icon here uh, on the other side, a famous icon from the sixth century, or this one, which I'm sure you've seen, uh, the uh, a Shroud of Turin, uh, which uh, tradition says was a, a burial cloth placed over the body of Jesus and then miraculously or not, his image was transferred to that cloth, which has been kept in the city of Turin in Italy to this day, where it is occasionally placed on view. Uh, the icon tradition on the other end here, this picture of Jesus is uh, important because icon painters argue that uh, painters don't make up pictures of Jesus or Mary or the saints they ground them in a tradition of recognizing Jesus, of seeing or the saint or whoever, and that the icon is authoritative because it conveys something of the being, the look, the visual reality of the original. Uh, so it's, once again, this idea of resemblance. And this actually isn't just peculiar to human beings. Uh, the image in the middle you probably can't make out very well but this is what I saw one morning from the uh, uh, window of my bathroom in Indiana when I lived there. 
uh, my cat was leaping into the air, going crazy, trying to get up to the ledge of the window. And I said, why is this cat acting so crazy? So I, I went in very quietly and watched the cat. And uh, the sill was about here. And the cat couldn't wait to get up here because there was an old bird's nest here that the cat knew about in this bush outside of the window. And uh, snowfall from the night before, a very thick, fluffy, lake effect snow, had settled in here and then started to melt and had created this wonderful shape of a bird. The, the cat was convinced there was a bird inches away from the window. And the cat, of course, wanted to consume the bird. So likeness is a kind of uh, drive to see what you want uh, and to see, uh, to be taken by the resemblance between the image and the real thing. That's one theory. And what we, you, you can see it in the history of Christian art and in powerful ways. For instance, in the story of the Veil of Veronica, uh, the story that says that on his way to Calvary, carrying the cross, Jesus paused at one point, and a young woman named Veronica gave him a cloth to wipe his face. And when he did and handed it back to her, she found his face imprinted. Uh, on the cloth, and she saved that, and it became, the story says, the model for icon painters. That's why icons look like Jesus, because they can trace their origins back to the veil of, the Veron of Veronica. There's another famous story, uh, perhaps originating in the East, um, of a guy named Publius Lentulus, who, the story says, was a contemporary of Jesus of Nazareth and was in Palestine when he was alive and saw him and wrote a letter back to the Senate in Rome. He was a Roman uh, official. And in this letter, he described Jesus, which started at the top of his head and just went down and described the shape of his forehead, the shape of his color of his eyes, the shape of his nose and his cheeks, his nature of his beard, the length of his hair the cut of his hair. And this uh, letter was circulated, and it became very popular in the 16th century to combine the letter, which you see here uh, in Latin, with a, a painting that was the visual version of the text. Uh, this still is around occasionally. People still have versions of this. So, Embedded in the history of Christian imaging is the assumption that there is a real origin, an authentic original available to artists through these texts and images that have been passed down uh, to uh, corroborate the likeness of Jesus. The second theory of likeness, what people mean when they say an image is like something, uh, could be defined as this. Likeness is the result of a powerful drive to emulate an archetype. Likeness is the desire to be the other, to become like the other. Uh, once again, outside of the human family, we can see something like uh, uh, this gosling trying to be like the swan, its, its parent, learning to move uh, like the parent, to be like the parent. Or in I mean, in the realm of human behavior, the consumer who looks at the, the, the mannequin and imagines herself, uh, maybe a better version of herself or a more desirable version of herself as that mannequin, wearing those clothes. So likeness is more understood in this sense as a psychological drive to be like another or another version of oneself. And third, for many Christians, the likeness of Jesus consists of the image that presents what he was like. So this twists the term just a bit. Likeness is the recognition of an affinity between me and another, uh, between uh, his appearance and what believers know, feel, or see within themselves about him. Christians recognize Jesus because they say, yes, that looks like him. What do they mean when they say that? In this sense, they mean he looks kind, he looks accessible, he looks merciful, he looks 
uh, tender, he looks compassionate. What they're seeing is their, in some sense you might say, their theology of his character, of his presence, of his nature as a human being, as a god, uh, as a redeemer. This aspect of likeness is the perception of an intimate connection, uh, a very emotional connection that devout viewers feel between Jesus and themselves. Uh, many Christians are drawn to become like Jesus in terms of kindness, in terms of obedience, uh, sometimes in terms of suffering. And I'm showing you different versions of this. Uh, <clears throat> this Italian painting shows a, an older Catholic tradition of the likeness of Jesus is in the suffering that one uh, experiences as a form of participation in his passion. Uh, so Catherine of Siena receives the stigmata from an image of the crucifixion and therefore draws closer to Jesus, becomes like him. Not becomes him, but becomes like him. Uh, or this one, uh, a recent image, uh, there are a whole set of these drawings by an artist named Gene Keaton who shows Jesus as a wonderful guy, a sort of smiling parental figure with uh, children and teenagers, hugging them, laughing with them, playing with them. Uh, it's a completely different Jesus than what we see uh, here. Um, it's a Jesus that, uh, for some people, feels very intimate, very close, their best friend, their close pal. Uh, for another, a generation older, this was the Jesus that uh, I did a lot of work on the popularity of this Jesus in the 1940s and 50s. People uh, now, people in their 70s and 80s, 60s, 70s and 80s, would tell me very much about this as their friend. This is their personal friend. Uh, always ready to hear them, to listen to their troubles, to reach out uh, and be a companion, a very faithful friend and companion. There was a, a likeness in uh, this emotional connection. So, just to review, three kinds of, uh, of likeness. The resemblance of an image to an original, the emulation of an archetype or model, and the recognition of, of an affinity of what the other is, is like. But, let's be skeptical for a moment and say that all the stories about uh, the Vale of Veronica and the account of Publius Lentulus, that those aren't true, that they can't have happened, there's no historical basis. There was no photographer present, there was no artist present, there was no, nobody named Publius Lentulus present to describe what Jesus looked like. That basically we have no clue what this guy looks like. No one really ever, after his death, saw him again in a way that we think, you know, like a photographer might or a filmmaker might see him and document him. And yet, I would go back to my, to my original claim, most of us walk around with different images in our mind when people say Jesus. We see an image, maybe uh, a filmy, unclear, hazy, grainy image, but we have some notion of what this guy named Jesus looks like. Why is that? Uh, well, how can we have an, an image of which there is no original? One way of thinking about this is that we are, each of us, gigantic, changing, rolling archives of images walking through time and space. Our brains are in the business of soaking up. We love to sponge up images and assemble vast visual archives in our memories. And we access these archives, and we uh, merge them, intermingle them, we separate them, we come up with our own notions according to our religious commitments, or our psychological needs, or our social associations, our economic classes. You can cut it in many different ways to try to understand the social, psycho, physical dynamics of mental imagery. Um, but if this thesis uh, is true, or has something to it, um, all of the images we've ever seen, from Sunday school to high school field trips to the art museum to devotional books, illustrated Bibles, whatever, all of those get uh, 
deposited here, organized, sifted, curated into our own private exhibitions, and drawn into some kind of a composite image that corresponds to this name Jesus. I'd like to suggest that evidence of such an archive, you might say, well, yeah, maybe somebody else has that, but I don't. I don't care what Jesus looked like. I'm not interested. I would suggest that there is evidence, tangible evidence, that you, are, that you do have an archive, an archivally curated image of Jesus. Uh, look at this. This, uh, this is an interesting sort of Rorschach blot uh, that proves it, I think. This visual formula of Jesus' likeness is so familiar that most people have no difficulty recognizing this random collection of shapes and marks as looking like Jesus. Did anyone look at this and not see an image that might be Jesus? It looks like Jesus. Why is that? Uh, how can that be? The broadly shared, as I put down here, uh, ability to recognize this pattern of marks must mean that there is a collection of images, an archive, forming something like an imaginary, a term s scholars like to use, this collective body of data, of information that we all draw on and that brings us together, that we share in. It's, it's, it's one of the ways we communicate with one another through this shared uh, set of uh, or pattern of, of thinking. And uh, Jesus emerges from that, an image of him. Another example of why I think there is an archive that we walk around with, um, proof of this shared sensibility. Look at this uh, corpulent Jesus on the cross. It's uh, a, a funny thing I, I like to use in class because it always gets a laugh because it's so obvious that this can't possibly be Jesus. And I asked students, why is it so obvious? Uh, I mean, he might have been a heavy guy. Uh, we don't know. I mean, we, we really, uh, there's, uh, I, you comb through the Bible, and you're not going to find much in the way of a description of Jesus. There's very little there, if anything, indicating what he looked like. Uh, that just wasn't on the minds of the people who wrote the New Testament documents. They, it wasn't important to them. It's much more important, I think, to Christians coming later, over uh, several centuries. And I still think it's important to many, many Christians today. They, they, they care about what this guy looked like. And he didn't look chubby. He didn't look overweight. He didn't look obese. Why is it he's always the skinny guy? Why does he always have a beard? Why does he always have shoulder-length hair split in the middle? Why is the beard typically forked? Uh, why does he have large brownish eyes and sunken cheeks? Why is his expression typically very, very solemn? Uh, not always, but typically. Uh, that's the archive, the sorting that our cultures do for us and, and, and that we perhaps participate in ourselves as we select an image that seems right. Have you seen this one before? This is an interesting image. In the year 2000 or so, uh, the BBC, uh, British Broadcasting Company, did an interesting uh, documentary on the image of Jesus. And they, uh, they wanted to produce something that would um, push people to think about the imagery and what it meant. So they took uh, four or five skulls of first century uh, Jewish men. They found that an archaeologist helped them find. And they uh, mapped that into a computer-assisted morphing program. And using uh, a, a, an interesting software technique that uh, forensic uh, psychologists and, and uh, uh, image makers use in re reconstructing uh, human remains to, to pro pro project the likeness of the person, uh, they produced this image. It has a kind of digitally based scientific authenticity. At least that's what they wanted to suggest. And they said, we don't know if Jesus looked like this, but we think on the basis of this historical data that we used, this actual anatomical information of Jewish skulls from the first century, contemporary with Jesus, 
that he probably looked more like that than he did uh, like all that Christian art that came long thereafter. We don't know, of course, but it's a, it's a fascinating visual experiment to challenge the uh, assumptions of the archives we walk around with in our heads. Uh, because it doesn't match that. It doesn't match the, the face that I described a bit ago. Uh, so let's come back to Rembrandt. Again, Rembrandt's painting. Um, why, uh, if you agree, why this looks like Jesus? Maybe not to everybody, but to a lot of people. I'd like to suggest that uh, Rembrandt is important because he changes, he's the game changer in a way. He's uh, a, a shift. He calls on the archive that he had inherited as a 16th, 17th century uh, uh, artist. He, didn't, he wasn't creating in a vacuum. But he's different. Yeah, first of all, he's Protestant, so uh, that means something. Um, we'll come back to what that might mean. Um, he calls on the, on the uh, record of Christian art before him in portraying Jesus, uh, but changes it. And what I'm showing you are a series of images done between 1648 and 1656. They're very small images. I've seen them in an exhibition in Philadelphia a couple years ago. They're about roughly 8 or 9 by 10 inches, about the size of an 8 by 10 glossy photograph, maybe a little bit larger than that. Uh, they're almost all virtually identical in size. We know almost nothing about what he intended to do with these. Uh, some art historians have argued that they're not just by Rembrandt, they're probably by people in his studio. He had a large studio at certain times during his career. He was training a lot of students, and he would let some of his advanced students paint, uh, join him in painting different, uh, different works. So there may be different hands at work in each of these images, but they're probably most of them under the direction of Rembrandt himself. What did he have in mind? Was he uh, creating, was he planning uh, a particular painting of Jesus? Uh, were these like sketches, studies? We don't really know. There are several of them done over a decade or so. Uh, it may have been that he was experimenting thinking but never actually ended up producing a final work of art. Or he may have been simply producing them for himself. Or he may have used them as teaching devices. We don't know. Um, it's been suggested by some that his model was for these, for these different figures was a, a, Jewish, a contemporary Jewish person, J Jewish man from Amsterdam. Uh, we know, in fact, that he did uh, paint uh, contemporary Jews uh, on commissions for them. Um, and that he was very interested in Jewish culture, uh, he was very interested in Jewish costume, uh, Jewish ceremony, he studied it and he incorporated what he learned into several of his paintings uh, of Old Testament subjects. So he was familiar with contemporary Jewish culture, very interested in it. Um, and uh, some of his contemporaries referred to him obliquely uh, painting Jesus uh, as a Jew. So that's taken by some historians as, as very suggestive evidence that indeed he did use a Jewish model. Now that's very interesting because if he did, it's historically unprecedented, virtually unprecedented. There are very, very, very few portrayals of Jesus in the whole history of Christian imagery showing him as a Jewish man. Christians tend, still today, when they picture Jesus, to make him look like themselves. He's white, he's black, he's Asian, he's uh, whatever, because there's something powerful about that likeness, about Jesus being like me. Uh, that's important for Christianity, and I want to think about uh, a bit about why that would be. Some people say that's racist, making Jesus white or black or whatever. Some people say it's ethnocentric, it's uh, racially or ethnically insensitive, maybe it's anti-Semitic. It's an in a very interesting question to pose and think about. Uh, this question of uh, what does it suggest about the very active imagination? 
Does it uh, impugn it? Is, are we somehow racist at a very, very deep level in the very thoughts we have? Uh, is Christianity an inherently racist religion? Uh, uncomfortably, if you read the New Testament, at least certain parts of it, you can find some real antagonism towards the Jews. Uh, look at the fourth gospel, for instance. Uh, and there is a bad, ugly history of Christian uh, bigotry and discrimination against Jews throughout the Middle Ages uh, down to the uh, modern world. So, <clears throat> I mean, all of that suggests that uh, this is a, is a live question. This is something one has to take very seriously, thinking about the ethics of imagination and the ethics of image making. Um, but uh, what's interesting in the case of Rembrandt is that if he did, in fact, paint Jesus as a Jewish man, it's, uh, it's fascinating because, in many ways, it does exactly the opposite of what we've been talking about in terms of likeness, because it makes him unlike many, most, virtually all Christian viewers. Uh, and it, then for, it would posit a distance between Jesus and the viewer rather than uh, an intimacy or a proximity. Uh, why would he do that? Why would he, why would he risk that? I mean, that's uh, just from a commercial point of view, that's kind of a, uh, a silly thing to do. Um, you want people to like the art. Some people looking at Rembrandt say, here was a, a, a unique and uh, extremely uh, provocative and um, inwardly directed person who wanted to take Jesus' humanity very seriously, who, in, in terms of his Protestant sensibility, wanted to take Jesus as a, as a historical human being in these images very seriously, to portray the actual guy, not what the history of art said about him, uh, but what one might argue he would have looked like, to recover that. So we get an image that is remarkable for uh, everything it's not. Look at these images of Jesus. These were the prevailing way of portraying Jesus for much of the history of the church with, uh, with full narrative settings. We know not just Jesus, but at the moment of the crucifixion. We can identify these people at the foot of the cross with, by looking at New Testament accounts of the, uh, of the crucifixion. Uh, the angels are there because of Catholic doctrine about collecting the blood, which was understood to be the basis for uh, the sacrament of the altar. Um, a Byzantine icon, uh, other images uh, from the Byzantine world that show Jesus encrusted in symbols and devices that convey the meaning of his office as God, as priest, as uh, redeemer. Uh, in other words, it's not just Jesus, it's all the accoutrements, the symbols, the devices that tell us what he means. Interestingly, Rembrandt gets rid of all of that. There's not even a halo. There's just this guy. And when you put all these images together, as I've done here, you get a kind of... Um, film still effect. You, you get Rembrandt looking at him from different angles, wanting to see how the light falls on different sides of his face, maybe suggest certain mood qualities, certain facets, almost, almost unspoken facets of his personality. Uh, no symbols, no devices that tell us what these mean. If we want to know what they are, we have to look at them. We have to engage this presence. In fact, I would suggest that what we have to look for is the personality of the guy. And that's a radically modern thing. Personality is not something people before the modern era even suggested. The word personality is a modern word. It didn't exist before the 19th century. Personality is something that moderns think of as this ephemeral, historically contingent, personal nature. That's you. Each of you has a personality that doesn't belong to anyone else. It's not your soul, it's something else. It's something that's made. It's something that comes into being the way your parents raise you, the way your biochemistry shapes it, the way your experience has 
crafted your unique identity. That's a very modern idea. Moderns believe in the sovereignty of personality. You each have one, and you deserve to have one. And it's yours, and it's no one else's. You have power over that. Uh, and it's who you are, and it's unique. I think we start to get some of that in Rembrandt, Rembrandt's portrayal of Jesus. And to get at that, he gets rid of all that other symbolic stuff. Because he doesn't want that. He doesn't want to tell you what Jesus means. He wants to show you who he is as a human being. In addition to that, we get the close-up. We get a head and shoulders portrait of Jesus, close-up. We get to draw near. And these are, as I said, very small images. So when you see them in a gallery, you want to get up very, very close. Uh, I was afraid the guard was going to get upset with me because the images draw you in. They're like, it's like looking at a small photograph. You have to get up close. Uh, and it conveys the, the intimacy of this personality, this very, very quiet image of a man. Close-ups were not new. Uh, Rembrandt didn't invent that. They came from Byzantium. They came from Eastern Christianity when the Latin West undertook its several crusades ostensibly to reclaim the Holy Land, Jerusalem, for Latin Christendom. But more practically, what they got out of them was a lot of loot uh, and mayhem and murder and, uh, 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 and robbery. And, they, and one of the, some of the things they brought back were relics. They love relics. Uh, relics were powerful, you know, the body parts of saints because every uh, altar had to have a relic. And the cathedrals were really designed to house these powerful bits of matter. Um, and there was an international trade in relics. And the Crusades uh, brought uh, hundreds and hundreds of relics from the East uh, to, to Germany and France in particular. Another thing they brought back are icons, which had been largely unknown in Europe before the 12th, 13th, 14th century. And these icons had a powerful impact. They actually transformed European painting. Painters in Europe in the 14th, 15th century were deeply influenced by these uh, small paintings and you, uh, pa uh, mosaics like this. And uh, I don't have any other icons here. But you can see how they influenced people like Albrecht Dürer in his portrayal. This is a self-portrait, but it's a self-portrait as Jesus uh, in a very frontal, beautiful, uh, presentation of the self that's remarkably similar to small icon portraits of Jesus. And uh, various other images by artists uh, that are small portrait style influenced ultimately by the icons that the Crusades uh, brought back to Europe. However, most of these continue to portray Jesus in key moments of his narrative. They are often designed to address uh, moments in the liturgy, like the 14 Stations of the Cross that Catholic, Catholics uh, performed in Holy Week that, to mark Jesus' steps toward Calvary and the crucifixion. Um, we see him, for instance, in the upper left over there uh, carrying a cross. We see him here uh, bearing the wounds of his uh, mistreatment, uh, Jesus here as the Pantocrator, the Lord of all, as he's typically shown in many Byzantine icons. Uh, here's the veil, here's Veronica showing her veil of the portrait of Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, carrying the cross again. Uh, so once again, we, we don't get a lot of abstract symbols, but we get the, the narrative of Jesus' life and we get references to liturgical ceremonial moments of the ritual uh, worship of, of Jesus. Rembrandt, the Protestant, gets rid of that. Um, we get just this uh, quiet, reflective moment of Jesus, uh, caught, uh, as it were, by the, the camera, we might say, thinking quietly, solemnly about, we don't really know what. Uh, and that's, that imprecision draws us in. It triggers our imaginations. We want to know. What's he thinking? 
who, you know, where is this in the narrative? We're not told. And by refusing to tell us all these details, Rembrandt's able to evoke from us a different kind of response, uh, a more emotional, reflective investment uh, in this image, maybe to think, to suggest to ourselves, perhaps, what it was. It, it, it encourages a subjective response from the viewer, uh, and therefore a different kind of visual relationship. And it allows, as I've said, to think about Jesus' humanity uh, as his likeness to humans, as the connection that people can have uh, with him. And that suits, generally speaking, a Protestant sensibility. So from there, I want to uh, close by leaping to the 20th century, closer to our own day, not quite there, and show you a few images that were uh, from the middle of the 20th century to near the end, prevailing images, and suggest that they derive something of their visual currency from the uh, visual agenda that Rembrandt set up. Uh, starting with Warner Salman's Head of Christ here, uh, which uh, was uh, created in Chicago in 1940 and then carried around the world by missionaries. I've been to Japan and Africa and, and Asia, and I've seen this image. It's amazing. It's everywhere uh, because Protestant missionaries took it with them, and they used it as a basic tool in teaching new Christians who Jesus was. They established this image in the imaginary of the imaginations of uh, folks around the world. Solomon enjoyed great prestige and power as a painter of Jesus' image for a couple decades. But then uh, a publisher uh, in St. Louis, a publisher, a, a Lutheran publication firm, produced this guy in 1964 as a rival image of Jesus. The kind of rough and ready Jesus, sh shaggy hair, kind of beach bum Jesus, had much more appeal to the youth culture that was emerging in the 1960s. And that Jesus eclipsed Solomon. Solomon's never competed with that Jesus again. Uh, this became the image of Jesus for many, many uh, younger Christians in the U.S. and elsewhere beginning in the mid-60s. In 1976, Franco Zeffirelli produced his uh, uh, famous image, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, his famous film. Uh, an Italian filmmaker uh, produced it in English, and it was a huge hit, uh, shown on every Easter for years and years and years. Uh, Robert Powell, the actor here, if you look at his face and look at the way the camera draws in, this is a, a still that uh, was frequently, still find this on the internet, it was frequently used in publicity. This was sort of the icon of the film. This is Jesus. Uh, we don't know, if you look at this image, it's very much like uh, Rembrandt in, the, in, in as much as we don't know what moment in the life of Jesus this image represents. If you saw the film, you might be able to determine it. But if you just saw this picture on it, uh, in a magazine or uh, internet or on television, you wouldn't know. Once again, like Rembrandt, that allows uh, Franco Zeffirelli to make this image of Jesus more personally engaging. Uh, one doesn't have to know the story. You just have to get the personality of this guy. That's what's important uh, in a modern visual sensibility. And this one is an intriguing. Have, have any of you ever seen this one before? I, uh, I, I, I knew of this picture. Um, because I'd seen it in uh, magazines, in Mormon and uh, Latter-day Saints magazines. Uh, and then one uh, uh, summer I was in Los Angeles, and a friend of mine, an anthropologist, we were wondering, what the heck can we do today? We like to go to museums that we'd seen all the museums. And uh, I said, hey, there's a, there's a Mormon church, uh, I mean a visitor center and temple nearby. You ever been to one of those? And he goes, no, I've never been to one. So we thought we were stupid Gentiles, we thought, well, we'll just, you know, go check out the Mormon temple. And of course, quickly learned that you can't get in if you're not a member of the church in good standing. So what there was that we could do nearby, uh, on the same grounds, was a visitor center. And we went in, and that is the Jesus that we saw. 
There were actually several Jesus, but this one, a very large, maybe like five feet high, it's huge. And a young woman was giving us a tour, and um, I said to her, I'm really interested to know why of all the hundreds, thousands of images of Jesus, why, why that one? And she thought about it, and she said, well, uh, I guess because the president of our church is uh, a prophet, priest, and a revelator. And she said that that means that he sees Jesus, and he speaks with Jesus, and he described him to Del Parsons, the uh, artist. So uh, we know that that's, that is Jesus. That's what he looks like, because we have an eyewitness. It was a remarkable thing she told me. I, I, uh, I was quite struck by it, because it reminded me so much of what I'd heard from the Christian tradition about the Vale of Veronica, about Publius Lentulus. There's an old story uh, that St. Luke was also a painter and that he saw Jesus and paint, I mean, obviously he saw Jesus, but that he painted a picture and left not only a gospel account of the life of Jesus, but also pictures, paintings of Jesus. And there are many other stories about miraculous images created either by Jesus, by angels and given to people, or uh, falling out of heaven, etc. Lots of these stories, very common. I thought, well, this is a kind of Mormon version of that old Christian tradition, the quest for the likeness, the authentic likeness of Jesus. Um, what's interesting about that is that it's kind of an intersection of that old, old Catholic and Greek tradition with the modern Rembrandtian tradition. Because if you look at this image of Jesus, the story is uh, the older narrative tradition, but the image of Jesus bears a, a, a good deal in common with uh, the images you see on the screen here and with uh, the idea that Rembrandt seems to have achieved in his portrayals of Jesus. We don't know what moment this is. Uh, we don't see uh, you know, halos. We don't see any kind of symbol, we just see the face of the guy with his determined look. It's a different look, uh, a different emotional quality, but uh, uh, perhaps it has uh, visual strategies that recall the suggestiveness uh, that Rembrandt tried to set up uh, as a new way of imagining the likeness of Jesus. Finally, where have things gone since? Um, and I'll, I'll end with this. Uh, in many ways, this tradition of Rembrandt has uh, uh, run out of gas. It's, it's broken down. Um, people sometimes ask me, what is the prevailing image of Jesus today? If Solomon had that head of Jesus in the 40s and 50s, what's the 21st century version? And I have to say, you know, there isn't one. Um, there's nothing like Solomon in the 1940s today. There's lots of Jesuses, all kinds of them. And what I'm showing you here is a collection of a variety of them, which suggest that there's been a kind of reversion to the, uh, the tradition of symbols and narratives to try to identify him, and also to push beyond the old into the new, into a new symbology, a new symbolic way of thinking about Jesus. A good example of that is this one by an artist named Janet McKenzie, who painted this picture in 1999. It won a, a contest for the Jesus, called the Jesus of the New Millennium, staged by the National Catholic Reporter. And Janet McKenzie uh, says that this is uh, her conception of Jesus for the next thousand years. She says, we've left the old Jesus behind. Jesus the man, Jesus the white guy, uh, Jesus the you know, uh, straight up New Testament encoded character. She says we have to have a new sensibility, a new way of imagining Jesus. So she pushes beyond that, shows Jesus as an African American woman who uh, used, she used as the model. Uh, she uses a black eagle feather to reference Native American spiritual traditions. Uh, a yin, I don't know how well you can see it, but this is a yin and yang 
uh, device from uh, Chinese Taoist tradition. And she shows Jesus. Uh, when I first saw this, I, I really didn't recognize it. Uh, I didn't know who it was. Um, Jesus, in the archive of traditional images, never poses like that. The Virgin Mary does. If I, could, I didn't bring any along, but I could show you portrayals of Mary with her hands crossed, typically that way at the moment of the Annunciation, when Gabriel's telling her she's going to bear uh, the Son of God. She, it's a, it's a, an image of, humili of humility, a gesture of humility. Uh, it's fascinating that she uh, selected that. What this Jesus wears is nothing like. It looks like a habit. It looks like a choir robes. It, it, it doesn't match the traditional iconography, um, which is fascinating because um, it, it, it subverts the psychology of likeness that I've been talking about. It says that likeness is not about recognizing the old. It's about hammering out a new conception, going in a completely different direction. Uh, it challenges the dominant categories of race, gender, uh, perhaps sexuality, to think about Jesus, to say he's not a white guy. Uh, think differently. Think, uh, think bigger. Think other. Um, Jesus is not like you. He's not like what your imagination says he's like. He's like something else. And it's up to you, she wants to say, to figure that out. Uh, so in some sense, it's a, it's a, it has a completely different relationship to the viewer. Uh, Jesus as a Jewish person, uh, Jesus as African or African American, Jesus as Korean, Jesus as Indian, uh, a variety of images that uh, challenge the archive and say you need to be broadened considerably or put to rest in order to create a new imagination of who this guy was. And that's fascinating because then it makes us ask uh, all over again, why is it that an image looks like Jesus? Thank you. Uh, I started uh, thinking about this uh, when I began work on this many years ago, uh, this picture of Jesus here. I was invited to a conference to talk about religion and art, and uh, most of the people there were thinking about, when you said religion and art, they were thinking about Bach, Michelangelo, Raphael, uh, really big, famous composers, famous artists, famous songwriters, people who had shaped, you know, the history of Christianity by their art of one kind or another. But during a break, uh, I said, you know, we were talking about all these really incredible artists, and I, I love them, uh, but what about, you know, the popular stuff that actually most people have hanging on their living room wall? Most people probably don't have Michelangelo's David hanging on their living room wall. They do have, I said, you know that, I, could, I didn't know the name, they've got that brownish picture of Jesus looking upward, that pious looking thing, this is what I was thinking of. And a guy there said, uh, the curator of the museum where this was taking place said, uh, at the break, he goes, you know, we have that picture of Jesus here. And I said, well, sure, I mean, every church basement has that picture of Jesus. And he goes, no, 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 we have the picture here, the real one. And I said, well, I didn't know there was a real one. I thought it was just, you know, like a circulating lithograph. So he walks over and pulls the original oil painting of this out of the vault. And I was astounded. Uh, you know, uh, it was amazing to see this thing. And uh, there was a, a really highbrow uh, theologian and art historian there, an older guy who, uh, very Anglican. And uh, he said, oh, that is bad art for bad faith. That's the, that's the 
It's disgusting kitsch. Just put it back. We don't want to see it. And I thought, because I wanted to be you know, contrary and I was young and a bit of a smart ass, I said, well, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you can trash it. But the fact is that picture of Jesus is probably lodged in most people's heads and comes up much quicker when you say Jesus than, uh, you know, Raphael or Michelangelo, as I said. Uh, that means that we need to try to figure out the power of that image. Um, so, and then we argued, and he didn't agree with me, because uh, he had this, this uh, kind of highbrow aesthetic of bad art for bad faith, period. And so we, we went back and forth, but uh, the argument was wonderful because it, it convinced me that there was a really an interesting intellectual problem here to figure out. Uh, to just set aside for the moment the issue of taste uh, and talk about psychology, talk about sociology, talk about history, uh, the way things get, you know, dealt and the, the accidents and the contingencies and just, and the needs that people have. So what I, I, what I did, I, I decided that I was not interested in what hangs in museums, I was interested in what hangs in living rooms for Jesus, because I thought that might get me somewhere. So what I did is I took out ads in about two dozen religious magazines and newsletters, newspapers. I reproduced that image, and I just asked people. I said, please tell me what you know about this picture. What's it means to you? Do you have it in your house? Who gave it to you, et cetera? And I got 534 letters in about a year. And these letters were enormously interesting, because they gave me insights into the criteria that people used to make these choices. And uh, I called up a lot of these people. I corresponded with them, interviewed them. I was able to go to some homes and photograph these. I found out really interesting things. 80% of the people who wrote to me were women. And most of them, were their, their average age was 59 or 60. They could tell me the person who gave them that picture of Jesus, when it happened, what occasion, where in the home they've hung it ever since, on what occasion they gave it to their daughters or their sons, what that image means to them in their old age. It was really interesting. There was a fascinating history of gender uh, about this picture of Jesus. And, uh, and, and people narrated their own life histories using that picture. Uh, so I found out a ton of stuff about the choices people make and the, and the visual practices they engage in by putting aside the issue about whether it's fine art or crappy art and asking, what is the power of this image? It's a, it's a different kind of question. And it uh, then led me uh, to a lot of other kind of work. And I've uh, really been very intrigued. So a long answer to a good short question. <laughs> Yeah. Mm-hmm. Of a certain kind, yeah. Yeah. It seems more intriguing to me because think about the complexity and difficulty of the human person. Um, I think we've learned a lot in the last hundred years about what a human being is. Human beings are not simply one thing. You have many sides. You have sides that don't even know the other side fully exists. You have parts of you that you deny, parts of you that you don't want to see. You have parts of you that are important and that get out by getting angry, by getting frustrated, by getting violent. You have parts of you that get out in the most sublimely wonderful ways. When you fall in love, when you meet the person who changes your life, uh, when you uh, can take care of a sick person, an old person, a child. There are all these amazing moments in a life that don't simply add up to one uniform, modular thing called a human being that has one face and one person. We're complexities of things at one time and over the life course. You're going to be doing and saying things 20 years from now that you 
can't imagine. And that's what makes life so mysterious and wonderful. We, we're never done. We just keep unfolding. Now, if you take that view of a human being, uh, a multiplicity of Jesuses makes far more sense than one. Uh, it's truer to the ephemeral, complex character of a human being. It captures more of him. What is Jesus? I mean, read the New Testament. You, if, he was a lot of things. He was a radical. He was political. He was apolitical. He was asexual. He was violent. He was passionate. He was uh, deeply learned. He was contemplative and mysterious. He performed miracles. He got killed. He got arrested. Somebody beat the hell out of him and then hung him on a cross. I mean, he's, he's so many things. He, he's not just one simple thing. Uh, so how are we going to capture that? I think uh, art can do that by showing the complexity, the difference. So I would say, yes, the complexity and the diversity is, is much better. And I think in our world, we become um, more ethically aware of the importance of diversity. Uh, and uh, perhaps this, the archive that's being formed now is going to be much more interesting for its diversity. Yeah, yeah, different geometrical shapes and solids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have it with me. Uh, it's, uh, it's a wonderful image. It shows the, uh, the image of melancholy, this, this woman who's dressed up and leaning over, and, and she has a, uh, a moody, difficult look on her face. Uh, and uh, she's melancholy. She's very, very troubled and searching and unresolved. And you have all this, this fascinating collection of geometrical solids and different devices and scientific devices around her. And I mean, there have been entire books written on just that print image. Uh, what does it mean? People talk about it as a part of the late medieval psychology of human personality, of human beings in terms of the four uh, temperaments. Um, it was part of a, a, a psychology, a, a psychology of types, and melan the melancholy type was one of them. Um, there's that which seems like a legitimate uh, uh, take uh, on her. It's also an important image because Durer uh, was coming along at a time when he was very impressed. He went to Venice several times. He went to the, uh, to the south, that is to Italy, and was very impressed with the Renaissance there, very impressed with what Leonardo and Raphael and others and Michelangelo were doing. And he said, you know, in the north, in Germany, people don't understand that artists are intellectuals. They are profound people, learned people. They are, cap they are the equal of poets. Uh, they're superior to historians. They can uh, think the great thoughts, and they can make art that shares and explores those thoughts. So we see an artist choosing scientific discourse as, in some sense, the subject of his art to demonstrate the power of the artist, which he thought he saw operating very well in the Renaissance in Italy and wanted to bring, bring to Germany. So in some sense, it's, it's art trying to expand the northern German understanding of what an artist was. Uh, and I think, he's, I think he was quite good at that. Mm -hmm. Thank you.